I'm Mike Tarantino. I'm uh, here to talk to you about recording music with free software. Um, I've been working in the record industry as a musician and recording engineer for 13 years. Um, and in that time, I've been really lucky uh, not to starve and to get to uh, work with, of course, all the tremendously talented people that I have been while doing something that I really enjoy. Yeah, it's probably not pointed at my face either. How's that? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, here's a picture of me with multi platinum recording artist James Blunt. Here's a picture of me in a tiny, cramped basement studio with independent recording artist Victoria Vox. Uh, I had another picture which unfortunately disappeared from the internet, which was me crawling around on my hands and knees trying to find the right patch point and sweat dripping down my <laughs> head. And, uh, and I was going to show you that one, and I was going to say, you know, apply yourself, kids, and this glamorous life could be yours. And uh, I don't have that photo. Um, but another thing that I was lucky about, in my opinion, was to be present uh, really for all of my career uh, during a pretty complete like, seismic shift in the technology is for recording. When I um, got to LA, the first record that had been completely produced in the digital domain, uh, first number one record had just been released, I think the year before, oh, yeah. which was that. Um, <laughs> but there was still a pretty big bias against uh, using computers to record. Uh, everyone kind of, the conventional wisdom was you had to record to tape and then dump it into the computer and edit it there and then go back out either to tape or just into a full console to mix. Um, and the people that I was working with were good in that they saw the way the things were going and that they were going to have to you know, adapt and find ways to get the sound they wanted without relying on uh, the effects that tape put on it. And uh, we did. We found ways to make it work. And, uh, we would shoot out every once in a while. People would say, you have to, like, OK, now you can record straight in the computer, but you can't sum in the box because the summing mixer doesn't work. You have to go out individual channels and mix them outside and then go back into the computer or go back to tape. And we would shoot out you know, pretty high-end boxes and see. And it always ended up sounding pretty neutral or, um, or in some cases, worse. So it was cool to be on top of that kind of technology and just to watch how things have shifted around. Um, there was one part, where, one uh, funny session I remember where we were midway through a record and a manager said to one of the bandmates and asked how it was going and he mentioned it was, we were working on the computer and, uh, and the guy got all concerned and said he wanted to, uh, he wanted to listen to this stuff before and make sure, you, you know, let me make sure it's okay. And, uh, and he asked, you know, what, ty what type of console is the producer using, what type, or what kind of desk was his words, which is what they call the big recording console. And the drummer said, oh, I don't know, it looks like a stickly, which is a piece of furniture. He was referring to the table that the guy had his monitor set on. <laughs> and uh, you know, that was, that was where it was at, and that was what we were kind of butting heads against. But it worked out. That record sounded great and came out, and I loved it. And it completely flopped. <laughs> Nobody heard it. Um, but I'm also a bit of a geek, um, although on the very lower bound, I think, of geekery in this. Uh, audience. Um, uh, taught myself enough Perl to write a script um, at my first job out of college to generate a config file for users. Um, and I worked in an IT department that had a Linux machine and I remember my boss needed to turn it off and didn't know how to do it and I was like yelling down the hall at him, it's shut down. And he kept walking and I don't know if it ever got shut down or not. Um, and I had a Linux running on a Power Mac 7200 in 99 which was uh, Kind of a pointless endeavor, but uh, but yeah, right. Yeah. It felt really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, I live in a freedom-loving household uh, with my wife Karen, who's the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. And uh, I've just got to take a second to uh, give a big shout out to GNOME Three because I really love what the GNOME team has accomplished during her time there. And it seems like every time she opens up her laptop, it looks better than it did before. So, go GNOME. <laughs> anyway, uh, the upshot of all that is that I really like free and open source software as a concept and I try to use it whenever I can. 
Um, and I'd like to get other people to use it too. Um, so I thought a bit about why music people should care about free software and how we can convince them to use it. Um, and it can be a tough sell. Um, the current generation of audio recording so software, of proprietary stuff, is uh, full featured and it's stable, then it's pretty well entrenched and people like that and like having compatibility with everybody else and being to send files back and forth and all the advantages that, uh, that that affords. Um, so for someone coming from a professional environment, it's probably not entirely realistic to tell them that you should immediately go entirely free and replace everything that you've got. Um, in situations where we're recording groups of musicians and uh, there's, uh, they're in the studio being charged by the hour, uh, a crash can be a really big deal. It's gonna cost you uh, time and money, which is really bad and potentially also be uh, catastrophic in that it costs you inspiration and costs you that moment. There's really kind of a volatile environment when you're recording that you, you know, if it's, if it's time to go and everyone has it in mind, it just doesn't come back if there's a problem. So you really don't want technical issues to be, uh, to get in the way of that. Yeah? Is that something that you've typically experienced in the studio in Pro Studio setting in Windows space? In Pro Studio's what? In, in the Windows space, so it crashes Eating up Windows, time. meaning like Microsoft Windows? Like Pro Tools or... Yeah. Um, yes, and we're going to get to that. <laughs> um, but complicating that is when I say catastrophic, um, we're not talking about the actual end of the world. We're talking about you know, ruining a session. And if you're a musician or a composer and your piece is going down and you're um, excited to document your masterpiece, that is a big deal. It's the end of the world. And I've been there. I've been like, you know, halfway bounced down and it crashes and the session gets corrupted and I want to just put my face through the monitor. And um, I'm sure, you know, because I care about music and probably a couple of you do too as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not like societally critical stuff that we're doing. Um, it's not a voting machine, for example, where if you want to convince somebody that we need free software in our voting machines, you can talk about privacy and you can talk about protecting our access to governmental representation. Uh, it's not a pacemaker defibrillator where if you want to convince somebody about that, you can talk about privacy again and you can talk about protecting people from uh, remote exploits of vulnerabilities. and. Uh, P. A. Wall gave a talk about open government, and uh, it was great and makes total sense. You can talk to people about uh, should our tax dollars be going to funding information that we don't have access to, and so on and so forth, and all these great applications of uh, free and open knowledge and software, and then you get to recording software, and it's kind of hard to find a really meaty reason to sink your teeth into to get people to understand why they should use it. Yeah? Maybe. Is it the radio? <laughs> Is it that guy? That's going to go off. That's going to go away. Up. I thought it was feeding back. Yeah. OK. Yeah, much better. Uh, still. How's that? Still like how we. Riding the edge. That, that works? Yeah, good. Mm, one more. Uh, Um, however, regarding stability, if you are trying to have this conversation with somebody, it's important to remember that it's not just free software that has bugs. Um, I was on a session once where we'd recorded all the basic tracks, the band had been out in the room and they all played together and you've got like 24 or 32 or whatever channels of, of music and uh, um, that was all done. Everyone sounded great. We made a rough edit of all the takes and then it was time for the keyboard player to do an overdub and he's, uh, he brought in his organ, which was a Hammond A100, which is this giant, heavy thing, and uh, it was painted also in this ridiculous tie-dye paint job. And so, like, three guys are hauling this in, and there's this big speaker, this big that spins around, and they get it all set up. And then we have to set up the mics, and the speaker rotates, so you need two over here and one on the bass, and get that sound together. And then we had to get the sound in the headphones, and that was screwed up because he keeps using the volume pedal, and that's affecting the level to the computer. So. Finally, we're ready to go, and everyone's happy, and it sounds good, and he's got his idea in mind, and we go, and I hit record. 
And instead of the track that we had just recorded coming out, every channel in the session sent out full-scale digital noise to the monitors. And in, this, in the control room, we were deaf, but he was really hurt. I mean, that's, he's wearing headphones, you know, and that's incredibly painful. Um, and I felt awful, like as bad as I've ever felt, because, you know, for a musician, this is a potentially career-altering situation, depending on how bad it is. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what I did wrong, but in the end, it was nothing. I rebooted the computer and hit record again, and the sounds came out, and everyone took a break, and we got right back to it. So just a glitch. In this case, not the end of the world, but you know, could easily have ruined the session and could have done worse. Um, there was another bit of buggy behavior that actually persisted for a really long time in one of the popular uh, digital audio workstations where um, when you would record, things would end up not quite where you thought they were, where you thought they ought to have gone. And I have no idea how many times this happened, because often it would be off by a couple of samples, which you'll never be able to hear. But uh, every once in a while, if something is in stereo, if something that has a, you know, two things that have a relationship to each other, um, uh, you would hear some kind of weird phasiness, and it's hard to it's hard to troubleshoot, right? Because you didn't hear it when it was being recorded, and things are supposed to go down at the right time, and it doesn't sound like two different things. It just sounds a little off. Uh, and the worst of that was when we were recording a solo, similar to the situation with the keyboard player, um, and did a bazillion takes. And somewhere in the middle, it just started, it got off by, I think, like 45 milliseconds, if I remember right, which is like, if it were drums, you'd hear it and know it was off and know that it was just the timing was bad. But on a solo where he's playing syncopated and you know, doing weird things, it just made it sound bad. And it was a horrible, I mean, it it's really sucks. You know, you look like he suddenly feels like, can I play? What's going on? And, like, um, and then we figure it out and you feel like, can we trust our equipment even? Can we trust like, the very basic tools that we're using to, um, to get this stuff down? So uh, the point of all that was that uh, just using proprietary solutions does not guarantee you to be free from bugs, and it doesn't uh, guarantee that you'll get a speedy resolution to your issues. That one persisted for months, and people were complaining on forums about it, and uh, it just kept going. Oh, that's weird how it changed. Um, uh, the other thing is um, it's cool to be able to use your software without jumping through a bunch of hoops implied by uh, hoops uh, forced upon you by uh, the manufacturer. Um, and the example that I always come back to is what if my awesome one-year-old gets it into her awesome head to take my hardware authorization dongle and throw it in the toilet, then I will be dead in the water until at such time as I can get a new one or get the um, and get all the license re licenses replaced. Um, and that's a big drag. So avoiding those kinds of situations. <laughs> uh, what's that? Oh. <laughs> what am I doing? Um, and another reason that you can give to people if you're trying to convince them is that you want to support freedom. Um, because being able to do what you want with your software is really important. And the more that we use and support the projects that we like, the more we'll be able to do with it. And the more people will be able to develop and the bigger the community gets. And that's an appeal to ideals and principles which are thought to be, I think, in kind of short supply in the music industry. But it's still the case that even if the state of free music recording software right now is not for everybody, if the, you know, the learning curve is a little too steep or the whatever, the hardware interoperability isn't quite there for everyone, uh, the community being built and the tools being put together are for everybody. And the stuff that, you know, it's going to keep getting better into the future and make these tools of production available to people who wouldn't have otherwise had them. And I think that's great. I think it's really worthwhile to be a part of, and I find it really inspiring. And it's why I'm so impressed by all of you, actually, um, who just keep working through the, these learning curves and the development and the issues and, and because of your ideals and because of what you believe in and for freedom. And I think that's awesome. So if you could all give yourselves a big round of applause, I would appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> yes, and another point is um, uh, getting involved in the free software community is fun, um, but I think a lot of the, the sort of hookiness of that and the fun of that um, is that you can actively participate. And if you're a developer, that's there's sort of an easy path to that, right? I mean, you can fix bugs, you can write extensions, you can do things that I don't know how to do. And most of the people that I would be talking to about this stuff also don't know how to do. Um, so if this comes up, um, one thing to remember is that there are other ways to contribute to a project, of course. And documentation in, uh, in the uh, music software realm is an area where we really need help. Um, so if anyone feels like uh, getting in there and contributing to uh, a manual that is like half incomplete or, uh, or anything at all, or more importantly, um, using that as a way to try to suggest to other people that they can be a fully participating member of the community, even if they can't program, I think that's worthwhile as well. So uh, we know why we want to use recording, uh, free recording software, and what are we going to use? Um, I looked at a bunch of digital audio workstations, not all of them, um, and the most kind of one-for-one -one feature compatible uh, one that I found was Ardor. Um, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, and I'd checked in on it a few times before, and it was, you know, I thought it was a great idea and uh, something that I hoped got better. I looked in on it recently, and I was really impressed. And looking at it, you kind of know immediately, if you come from a recording background, that you're going to be able to do the stuff you want to do. Um, the sort of basic functions of recording are intuitively available, and that's an awesome thing. Um, Ardor relies on a program called Jack to handle routing of audio from the interface into the program itself. So you've got your whatever thing that your microphone plugs into, and that has to go into the computer and into track one in your digital audio workstation. And uh, Jack is what handles all that behind the scenes. Um, that kind of turned me off at first, because it seemed like a clunky solution and involving uh, two programs that might not play so nicely together. But uh, they're both developed by the same person. And in practice, it works so seamlessly that it just seems like there's only one program. You run Jack at the beginning and then uh, never think about it again. And Ardor accesses its functionality when it needs to. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it actually works uh, quite well. Let's see. Oh yeah, I remember. Uh, the other cool thing about uh, Ardor is that it's not just limited to routing audio within Jack. Um, it can route stuff from any application in your computer into, uh, into Ardor. So um, in this case, can you read it from back there? Yeah. If you wanted to, say, record a Skype call into your audio workstation for some reason, here I had Skype running. And you can see when I pull up the input window for this track right there, you've got two inputs. And Skype just shows up as another option. Um, next to all of the Ardor tracks or the system hardware. I think that's amazing just because it's the kind of thing that we've, you, you can do it. You know, we've all done it before, like run the, little, run the cable out from the computer and back in and done this clunky thing and lost a generation of uh, digital analog conversion and had it sound terrible. Um, but, or I don't know, convert your file and then make it into a format that Ardor can read and import that. Um, this is so much more elegant, and I don't know how I did it, and I'm not aware of any solution that's not uh, free software that lets you do that. So Ardor and Jack, we like them. Um, what else do you need? You need an interface. If you're running Ardor on a Mac, um, you can use any Core Audio compatible one. Um, if you're already recording, that's probably going to include whatever you're using, so that's cool. Uh, if you're on Linux, you need an ALSA or FATO compatible interface. ALSA is the USB driver, and FATO is the FireWire one. Um, that's going to be a smaller list. It's going to limit you somewhat. Um, the uh, Army Fireface, Army is the manufacturer, gets really good reviews. And I don't have one, unfortunately. So if I were to set up a studio from scratch, um, I would probably get one. Um, I'm planning to use, make it a fully free, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's an audio recording interface. Does everyone know what that is? It's like the sound card. Sound card. <laughs> yeah. It is expensive. Um, it's, it's a 16 channel sound card. Um, and uh, yeah, if, I, if that's what I was doing, I would get one and expect it to work pretty well based on everybody else's experiences. And also based on the fact that RME is one of the few companies that has worked with the Fado developers to provide them with the documentation they needed to uh, actually make something that works. Um, if I were just trying to implement free uh, solutions in a studio that I already had going, I probably would run it on a Mac and um, uh, and just use whatever interface I'd already had. Uh, the wrinkle in that is that if you want to record on a Mac, the, the latest version of Ardor does not exist as anything other than a beta, which doesn't let you save. Uh, plugin settings. So what you would end up doing is running the old version 2.8, recording, uh, then firing up a Linux partition so that you could open the current version, mix and bounce in there uh, off the same session. So we know we're going to record. Um, and we have. We've got some music that we've recorded and now we're going to do some things to it. What are we going to do? Uh, does everyone know the punchline to this one? No? The records are like sausages. If you knew how they were made, you wouldn't like them. <laughs> so, uh, so what are we going to do? We are going to, uh, um, we are going to replace drums and tune vocals. Um, <laughs> which are, uh, people sometimes get kind of funny when you talk about that stuff uh, because it's, um, it's weird, right? It makes it feel like you're listening to something fake. And, uh, and I get it because it's weird to think that a band that you like is faking it on recordings that you have an emotional response to. Um, so knowing how much smoke and mirrors are involved in uh, you know, presenting a seemingly effortless uh, human expression of uh, of creativity can kind of ruin the buzz, uh, but we're going to do it anyway. So, um, <laughs> so why do you need to replace drums? Um, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, there can be a technical problem with a track um, that means you can't use it. So, if there's a bad mic or a bad cable, there can be a noise on a track that makes it impossible to be used. Um, the track might just sound bad in a way that was not feasible to address during the time of the recording. Um, if the recording was of bad quality or if the instrument was uh, not so good or the recording space wasn't so good, you might have issues with that. Um, if you're going for just a bigger sound than is possible with a single uh, instrument or a sing in this case a single drum kit playing, um, then one way to go about achieving that is to uh, uh, add some complementary sounds to what already exists. Um, and the other is that as the um, as the production goes on, uh, sometimes the track just takes a different direction than it had at the beginning. And you add the vocals, and you tweak the arrangement a little bit, and suddenly the original sound isn't working. And so you need to do a little work to, uh, to get it to work. Um, so, and it, it's a, so yeah, so it's a very common editing task. Um, so to do this, we're going to open up Ardor. We're going to have. Um, a track with our original kick performance. It would ordinarily be a lot of tracks with the full drum kit, but I just, for visual simplicity, made it this way. Um, and then another track for the kick sample that we're going to bring in. Now, um, if you have a lot of time, you could place each one by hand. Uh, you'd have to drag it into place and then zoom in really close. Slide for that. Yes, zoom in really close so that you could line up the transients so that they don't sound like too clickety clackety things, it sounds like one powerful hit. And then you'd have to zoom back out and get to the next hit. And, um, and it would take a really long time. Um, why can't we just apply a grid to the recordings and, um, you know, like you were making a beat? Do people know what I'm talking about when I say that? Making a beat? You're like, yeah, you have your grid, you bring in a kick and a snare, and you put the kick on beat one and three, and the, and the snare on beats two and four, and then you loop that bar and sit back and bask in its pristine <laughs> rhythmic regularity. 
Um, but in this case, um, I played these drums, so regularity was not was out the window. And uh, <laughs> so if we tried to apply that kind of approach of just sliding things onto a grid, it would not work. It would sound terrible. So um, to make this easier, we need a way to find, uh, uh, find it for the computer to identify the transients and then be able to easily get to them, get to where the notes happen. Um, to do that, we use the uh, hilariously named rhythm ferret, which is uh, a feature in Ardor um, designed to do exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, what you do is highlight the area that you want to work on, um, adjust the threshold and the silence threshold, oh no, it's the peak threshold and the silence threshold, sorry, um, and hit analyze. And what it does, I have the mouse, uh, the, uh, the cursor over that one line, that one line that turned red, but I don't, can you see the other lines on the other, uh, on each other note? They're just really faint, yeah. Um, so it analyzes the track, it figures out where it thinks the beginnings of the hits are, and it puts those lines in. And uh, if it puts in too many, you can adjust the threshold up. If it puts too few, you can adjust it down. Um, and then uh, keep going that way and hit analyze again after every time and keep going that way until you get it generating a line for every drum hit and hopefully no extras. Um, in my experience, the peak threshold didn't do anything, and neither did the detection function, which had all these cleverly named options. Uh, so the only thing you really had to worry about was the silence threshold. So once you've done that and gotten it to where it's Uh, you've got the lines in place. Uh, you have the operation set to split region and then hit apply. And what it does is turn your single region for your whole performance into a bunch of regions with the beginnings at the beginning of every note. Um, and that's going to be cool because Ardor has uh, another function that I've never seen in any other uh, audio workstation. Of course, there's no, there is a pointer, that's good. Um, which is to set your grid not only to uh, bars or beats or subdivisions thereof, um, but also to the beginnings of regions. So what that means is when I then, when it comes time to click on that and drag it to the next note, it's going to snap to the beginning of the region that we just created. And the beginning of that region is right at the beginning of the note. And so if you, you know, if you've got your whole track laid out, you just drag, 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 drag to the next one, and it happens really fast. I got this song done in, I don't know, one or two minutes, um, which was cool and comparable, I think, with the, uh, with the performance of the um, similar functions of, uh, of competing audio workstations. Uh, oh, we skipped one. Aha. So why isn't it working when you do this? Um, just uh, there are a few gotchas for generating those uh, points where it's going to split the region into the different notes. Um, one is, did you select the whole region? It's very, um, or it seemed intuitive to me anyway, to not do a whole track at a time and write, just have a selection of, say, four bars and try to do that. And, get your head around it. Um, there's a lot of reasons you might want to, well, there's one reason you might want to do that, which is that uh, if the dynamics shift can significantly during the song, then the silence threshold that you use to get the right number of, to get it thinking where the peaks are is going to be different during the quieter parts and the louder parts. Um, but if you try to do that, uh, it just will sit there as if it's not working and um, you will wonder what's going on and keep hitting analyze and getting frustrated. Um, and I'll, the only, uh, it's no big deal, you just split that selection out into its own region, which you can do by extending your hand and hitting the S key, and then proceed as normal. Um, ah, yes, and the other is using note onset mode instead of, okay, I have it there. All right, well, the alternative mode is, uh, is percussive onset, which, again, intuitively, you would think you would want to use um, when you're working on percussion. It's supposed to detect the transient and 
and the other one is supposed to detect a change of note. However, um, I did not get percussive onset to work at all. So word to the wise, um, if you're doing that and it seems to not be detecting the notes correctly and putting them like right in the middle of uh, where some hits go, then uh, give note onset a try and I think you'll have much better results. You could, of course, just lodge your bugger. Sorry? You could lodge your bugger. Yes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No. No, I would not. Um, That's fascinating. Yeah. See, see, from our perspective, right, we, and, and I speak as the collective, we write this right, and so we expect the users, you, yeah. to go, no, this is fucked, here's how you fix it. Right. You know? Yeah. So what do we as, a, as developers need to give you so that you feel comfortable to tell us that it's broken, rather than tell us how to do a workaround? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the main the main barrier is just is just cultural. I mean, we're, I'm not used to the sort of rigidly formatted procedures for um, and the types of responses you get when you try to um, try to file these reports. I mean, I've read uh, logs of these things, and they're very helpful when other people have done so. Um, so there's no there's no reason that um, that I can't do it. I think uh, the fact of the matter is I'm still very much just kind of peeking in. And um, getting more familiar with this, uh, with the software and the community is going to, uh, will just make it a lot easier for everybody. But I think that um, if you want to get, like, for people to do that, they really have to uh, feel like they're a part of the group. And it's just not going to happen right away, I don't think. I think there's, you know, they're coming from a very different place. Um, but I don't think, I mean, that doesn't mean it's, hopeless or anything. I just think people need to spend a little time. It's just, it doesn't come really natural to me. Oh, yeah. So there you are, and when you split it all out, it ends up looking, or when you drag out your uh, notes to the right locations, that's what it ends up looking like. Original track is up there. It's split into a bunch of regions, um, which we don't care about. It doesn't affect how it plays back at all. I believe there's a way to put it back if you have some visual issue with looking at it be split up, but uh, don't need to. And the samples are just right in the right spots. And let's see. Drum snippet, no sample. She never got to dump me and I still had a really good time And I drove home at midnight and the radio was screaming No. Oh. Um, so yeah, I mean in that case I think it's a pretty... Did everyone hear the difference? Everyone knows? Yeah, it's obvious? Okay, good. Um, yeah, and hopefully obvious why it was worthwhile. I mean, the original sound, I remember doing it and I liked it and I set up the drums so it would have that kind of flubbery like sound but uh, it doesn't really like I say the track evolved and it didn't really cut it anymore I needed something with more low end and punch so it's really nice to have that option and it's awesome to know that uh, that I can do the same effect in a free software uh, environment is the workflow in Ardell for that significantly harder or easier than the workflow in typical professional tools? Um, what I just described is, I would say, easier, um, with the caveat that uh, there's less uh, less flexibility. It's kind of um, the the similar tool in Pro Tools say is called Beat Detective, and um, it has a lot more features and options, and it's um, 
And the truth is, this is my own song that I did for fun. If I was working on a record, it would take longer because you're not going to send it back without looking at, without listening very carefully to every note, you know, and making sure that everything's okay. So um, it will take longer than this. It would also take longer in any other um, uh, in any other environment. Uh, what I liked about this is that it was impossible to get too precious about it. Really, um, you kind of have it generate those markers. And you, I looked in, you know, I examined a fair number of them, and they were all pretty much right on. It was actually, it was impressive to me that it worked so well. Um, I was expecting to have to go through each one and, uh, you know, start to slide things around, but I didn't. And um, I thought it sounded fine and pretty good. So I was very much encouraged by that. And like I say, the time it took was, you know, comparable, if not shorter. Uh, then it would have taken me in, in Pro Tools, which is the program that I know pretty well. How much time do we have now? There was seven. Seven? All right. Uh, there was, uh, there, maybe we've got time for one more thing. Um, uh, another effect that uh, I wanted to recreate um, was this, which is a, uh, it's called AMS was the manufacturer and DMX is the name of the box. Um, and it was this really cool delay, stereo delay box from the 80s, I want to say. Um, and it had this kind of one classic uh, uh, preset, which was the original signal would go in, and it would put it in stereo, identical so far. And then you had the, the classic setting was you would pitch shift the left side down by like, excuse me, five hundredths of a semitone and the other side up and then apply vibrato to each one, and it just kind of makes it all sound big. And the, sort of the, I think the classic 80s thing would be to do it on vocals, and then you hear it today, and it makes you want to throw up. But um, I thought maybe we could get a similar thing going on a synth that sounded kind of harsh and nasal. Um, so I hope this is going to be comprehensible. The, uh, what was required to get that effect was to have the original track here, and then to duplicate it twice. So up here is the name. MS was what the synth was called. Here's MS left and MS right. And the original one's in the center. The uh, one on the left is on the left, and the right is on the right, of course. Um, and then there are two plugins that I used. This AM pitch shifter. What have I done? Sorry? Why in the world did I do that? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the first thing is the pitch shifter. Uh, and I have them up here. This is the one on the left, and this is the one on the right. And they're just represented by these plug-in boxes here. Does that, how many of you know what you're looking at? Like, do people, yeah? Like, seeing a plug-in on an audio track makes sense? Okay, good. Um, so. The one on the left is down by five cents. The one on the right is up. Um, and then the vibrato that makes the pitch wobble in and out. Um, again, there's the one on the left and the one on the right. They're right up here in the plug-in windows. Um, I tried a couple of ways. The, uh, having three copies of the audio track is kind of weird for me. Normally, um, what you would want to do is have the original and then route that into a, into a bus. Everyone know? Yeah, into a bus. Yeah, good. Uh, in this case, the latency made that un, uh, unworkable. And that I never really found a solution to, although I don't think that's an issue of bug report. I think that's probably an issue of just figuring out how to make it work. But um, in this case, having three copies of it and processing two of them differently um, provided a good solution. So. from here, I actually 
things sounded kind of neat, but uh, <laughs> at the time, <laughs> it was bugging me. They, uh, they seemed to occupy the same harmonic space and uh, or, uh, frequency ranges and, and didn't seem to be working too well together. So with the effect applied, that's what happens to the synth. And can you hear it out there? Did it get wide? like the flute sits in the center and the other two on this uh, and the, the synth wide on the sides rounding it out and that I really liked it um, let's see I was gonna talk about tuning but I think we're uh, are we at a good point to stop for questions yeah sorry yeah Mm -hmm. What do you think is a good um, a good intro to actually making the music that comes out the other end sounds good? Because you know I've tried this and, and I find that mixing and all of this, the plugging and stuff, I have no idea what it's Yeah, about. yeah. Um, and that sort of that ties back to what I was saying about the documentation. There, um, I I don't I haven't found one really. I mean, I was looking to figure out ways to do the things that I wanted to do, um, and like I say, if you wanted to use if you wanted to use Logic, there's like a month's worth of videos for you to, you know, look at on YouTube that'll teach you how to do the most, you know, from the simplest to really advanced recording techniques. And there really isn't so much for this. Um, so it's one of the things that I'd like to work on is putting together a library of not just the manual, which is great to have each, you know, just very dry documenting each function of the program, but also what is a good workflow to make this make sense and what are plugins that work. Um, the plugin situation's funny. Have you, have you opened Arter? Before? Yeah. yeah, okay. So you know when you go to the plugin window, you say like insert new plugin, and there's this list like, yeah, of things that you have no idea what they are. Some of them, are, some of them are cool. Um, there was one that was, uh, I wish I could remember so I could plug it. Oh, it was the Caps Cabinet Simulator, and it's it was great for like parallel processing. You have like your original track, and then you make a duplicate of it and put that cabinet, cabinet simulator on it and it, you know, blend a little bit of that in and it's really cool. Um, others, you just put it on and the track would go silent and it's probably not the effect you were looking for. And, um, <laughs> and uh, just a guide to the plugins would be, would be amazingly helpful, you know? Um, so I'm sorry to be really not super helpful on that one, but I don't think the state of things is so great in that area right now, and it's one of the things that I would like to work on and encourage others to work on as well. Yeah? You modify the drum track. Does that happen to other instruments, or do you stick on drums? Yeah. Drums are, um, drums are funny because they're, uh, they have the most microphones on them by far, and a lot of things have to go right for that to work well, you know, and not have any, uh, have any problems. Um, in this case, uh, this was recorded in a basement um, in Los Angeles, and there was, it was just parallel walls and very low ceilings. Like, there was no way to get a sound with, uh, with much low end out of that room. Um, so, yeah, there are specific issues to drums that don't really exist with other instruments in the same way. And further, with just the way we're conditioned, even though this is like a, you know, folky, I guess, whatever, um, track with synthesizers, um, we're conditioned by the state of modern music to find the drums to be very important. And so, you know, if the, the kick drum has a specific function where it really drives the, you know, drives things along and the snare drum has to provide that backbeat and if they're not working perfectly well, then a pretty common way to address those kinds of issues is to bring in new sounds. Are we, one more? One more? No? All right.